Hi there everyone, I'm super excited for this video today because I'm going to be DIY building a lithium ion battery pack. I'm going to be testing it on my battery tester and seeing how it compares to some commercial lithium ion packs from the likes of Lumineer and Goldline. This all goes back to a few weeks ago where I tested some lithium ion packs and we found that we could get about 20 or 25% more flight time out of a lithium ion pack than a comparable LiPo. If you're interested in the results of that testing, there's a link to that video down in the description. But I got some comments on that video saying that it all comes down to the choice of cells. The better the cell you use for the lithium ion pack, the better it's going to perform, and that the best cells that you can buy today are MolyCell P45Bs. So with that in mind, I went and bought some MolyCell P45Bs, and now I'm going to be building them into the pack and seeing if my DIY pack can beat all of the competition and top the charts. It's a lot to cover in one video, so let's not waste any more time. Let's dive right into it. So we're going to start by building our battery pack. And for that, we're going to need our cells. These are our MolyCell P45B21700 INR cells. We've got four of those because we're going to be making a 4S pack. We need something to connect those cells together. So I've got this copper braid. This is uh, 10 millimeters wide by one millimeter thick tinned copper braid rated for 63 amps. So that's going to give us plenty of current carrying capacity for our pack, given that these cells are only rated to 45 amps. And then we have this. This is going to be our donor 4S battery. So I'm going to be taking the discharge and balance lead off of this and using it on our lithium ion cells. So first things first, we are going to need to prepare these cells for soldering. So for that, I have a little bit of sandpaper. This is PAT sandpaper. And I'm just going to be sort of scratching away at the top of the cell, making sure that that surface is nice and keyed and roughed up so that it's going to take some solder really nicely. I'm going to do that for the top and bottom of all of these cells. Now that we've got all of these cells prepared and nicely keyed on the top and bottom, I'm going to prepare them into a pack before we do the soldering. So for that, I'm going to use some uh, double-sided foam tape and just some standard vinyl electrical tape as well. So we'll start with the foam tape. I'm going to take a strip of this and use a thin strip on the side of each battery to hold it to the neighboring cell. And we'll cut that down the middle. All right, so I've got the four cells, each with a strip of the double-sided tape on, and I'm just going to arrange them correctly. So we need positive and negative side of the cell next to each other, so like that. And then we also need another negative on that side. And then uh, finally, positive. So that's our pack there. And then just for some extra security, I'm gonna wrap it in a couple of strips of this orange electrical tape. And that should keep it all nice to nicely together. The foam double-sided tape is really doing all the work here, holding these cells in place. This electrical tape is really just um, an extra layer just to stop anything being able to come apart. Okay, so with those all together, it's time to protect the cells. Now, the thing about these lithium ion cells is they have uh, a positive terminal on the top and then the can of the cell which goes all the way from the bottom all the way up to about here around the top is the negative terminal so it's possible if you didn't have this plastic protection here to short the positive straight onto the negative they're not that far apart to avoid that what i'm going to do is i'm going to take some kapton tape this is a uh, high temperature um, polyimide tape and I'm going to cover all around the top of each of the positive cells so that we can definitely avoid accidentally shorting the positive to the negative of the, of the, uh, of the same cell. So for that, I'm just gonna cut a little bit of tape and make those modifications. So you can see that what I've done is I've just covered the whole area around the positive terminal, but I've left the positive terminal uncovered so that we can make our solder joint. You don't need to do it on the negative side because there's nothing here you can short against. This is uh, this can is just all the negative terminal. It's just on the positive side that you've got positive next to negative can. You can see that they do pro provide this sort of little plastic um, protection here, but that's not high temperature rated. So you can melt through that with a soldering iron, but the capton tape 
um, has much better temperature resistance, so you're not going to be able to melt through that. All right, so now we have everything nicely protected and we can start the process of soldering this pack together. And to do that, we are going to pick which terminals we want to be the discharge terminals. So let's say this one and this one, and we're going to start by soldering on our discharge leads onto this terminal. To solder this pack, you're going to want a nice, powerful iron set at a really high temperature. So I've got my iron set to 400 centigrade and I am just going to tin the top of this contact. Use plenty of solder, plenty of heat, nice big blob, and you want to see it start to flow onto the pad and make a really good electrical connection because this connection is going to have to take, oh well, probably at least 45 amps of current. So there we go, that's the first joint. And we're going to do exactly the same on the negative side. So. Again, just use lots of solder. I would say you could probably use a bigger iron than I'm using as well. This soldering iron probably doesn't have a big enough tip, really. Um, but, you know, make do with what you have. There we go, that's starting to flow now. And once you've tinned the pads like this, it's time to solder this, the discharge lead on. And I'm gonna do this by uh, removing the discharge lead off this donor 4S pack, uh, which has reached the end of its life but I can recover the cables from that and use those on this new pack. All right, so here's our discharge lead and we will solder that onto the pack. All right, so now we've got our discharge lead soldered on, positive and negative. Um, we just need to connect the rest of the pack up. So we're doing this in series. It's gonna be a 4S 1P configuration. So we're gonna solder, turn this over and then uh, solder two braids here and here and then one braid here and that's going to complete our pack and once we've done that we can solder on the balance lead. All right so I've had a few practices and I'm going to try and show you what I think is the best way to make these solder joints with the copper braid. If you take a, a length of copper braid that's just about stretches from halfway along the contact to halfway along the contact so it's quite a short length you place that copper braid onto the, the pack where you're going to solder it and then you want to make the joint half on the braid, half on the contact. And that way you can guarantee that you're gonna get a good electrical connection to both the copper braid and the contact on the battery. So for that, again, nice hot soldering iron, plenty of solder, and you're just gonna place the iron just on the edge here, and then add solder, and that's gonna wick to the copper braid, but it's also, right next to the contact of the battery. So you're also going to be able to add solder directly onto the contact of the battery. And that's going to give you a good connection to both pieces. And that's what you're looking for. So just keep the iron on the edge there, adding solder. And as everything gets hot, it will start to flow. Once it's sort of set in a location, you can just move the iron slightly and add a little bit more solder. And you can sort of create like a weld line along the edge of the braid between the braid and the cell of the pack. And you just go carefully like this. You can make this kind of long contact between the braid and the cell. Uh, that one didn't flow onto the cell. Let me get the cell surface quite hot enough there. Add a bit more solder, give it a few seconds, and then it will flow onto the contact of the cell. There we go, just starting to go now. Beautiful. So just like that, you've got the contact on the cell, you get the contact on the copper braid, both at the same time. So you want your iron sort of half on the contact of the cell, half on the copper braid, move it around a little bit, making that contact, that's another nice one there. And then you can always go back, maybe just try and bring that contact down. Once you're happy with it, just leave it alone. You don't want to overheat this cell because you'll damage the, the battery. So once you're happy with the contact, just leave it and let everything cool down. And if you want to go back to it um, because you're not happy with it, then it might be best to sort of leave it to cool down in between so that um, you're not sort of stressing that battery. And using a big iron with a hot tip really helps because it means you can make that joint nice and fast. 
the positive contact, so I've done the negative here. The negative is definitely harder because there's more thermal mass. The positive contact is pretty easy by comparison, but you just use the same method. So iron half on the braid, half on the contact, add solder, and then wait for the heat to make it flow. And this will take a lot less time on the positive contact because there's a lot less thermal mass. You can see it's already flowing nicely. So just keep adding solder, getting that joint nice and spread across the contact. And then you might just want to use a pair of needle nose pliers like that just to hold everything in place while the solder solidifies. And you get a really nice joint onto the contact of the battery and onto the copper braid. And that's going to give you good electrical connection between the battery and uh, the neighboring cell. With our pack all nicely completed, all that remains is to solder on this balance connector. And the way we're going to do that is we've got to start from the negative end of the balance connector, which you can see is the black wire here. And then this red wire is obviously the positive end of the balance. And we are just going to go around and tack the balance connector wire onto each appropriate contact. And you can just do that on top of the joint you've already made. There we go. That's one. And then you go around the battery just going up one cell each time. So that was on the negative contact. Now we're just going to go up one to the positive contact of this battery. A little tip here, the positive contacts of the cells are much easier to solder to because they've got much less thermal mass. So where you have a choice, so you could connect to either of these two, um, just tacking it onto the positive terminal I think is a little bit easier. And we're going to go up another cell. So that's this one here. All right, so there we have it. We have our full pack with all of the balance connectors. Now, obviously, if you were doing this for yourself, you're making flight packs. This is this is just a test pack. But if you're making flight packs, you could, uh, you know, cut the wires and use wires that are longer so that the balance connector just comes out of the top of the, the battery at the end. But these are all the connections that you need to make. And I'm now going to wrap this battery up in uh, some duct tape just to prevent anything shorting out and then put it on test. Before I charge this pack, I want to do some final tests to make sure everything has gone okay. So I've got my multimeter set to voltage here and I'm just going to take the negative of the balance lead and check that we get 3.5 volts per cell on the first, 7, so that's 2 cells on the second, 10.5 on the third, and 14 on the positive. So you want to make sure that you get the right voltage and the voltage steps up by one cell each time you go along the balance lead. And then we can just do a final check of the voltage on the balance, on the discharge connector, and that's also 14 volts. So this pack is good and it's ready to go on the charger. I hope you're enjoying the video. If you are, please consider supporting the channel, either directly through my Patreon or indirectly using the affiliate links down in the video description. If you're about to buy something on Amazon, why not click through on my Amazon affiliate link? It won't cost you anything. Amazon will make a little bit less profit off of you and Jeff Bezos will send some money my way to help make more videos like this for the whole FPV community. It's a win-win and I would really appreciate it. All right, so we have our DIY lithium ion pack made from these MoliCell P45B cells. And it doesn't look like much, does it? But we're gonna put it on the test machine and see how it compares to the commercial packs from Lumineer and Goldline. And if you're interested to know the test methodology, I'll put a link down in the video description to my test video for those packs. We're gonna be using exactly the same test procedure for this DIY pack so we can make a completely fair comparison. Let's start by looking at capacity. And I measure capacity using a constant power discharge test 5C times the nominal voltage of the pack, all the way down to 2.5 volts for these lithium ions. And what we can see is that the Molly cell pack gets significantly closer to its rated capacity than either the Gold Line or the Lumineer Nav. And we shouldn't expect lithium ion packs to necessarily reach their rated capacity under a 5C discharge because they're typically designed to be discharged much slower than that. But you can see that even at 5C, the Molly cell pack does really well and gets up to about 4.4 um, amp hours compared to the 4.5 that it's rated for. Capacity is all well and good, but it doesn't take into account the voltage of the pack during discharge or the weight of the pack. For that, we need to look at energy density. And here we see the Molly cell does really well, 0.2 watt hours per gram for energy density. That puts it about 9% ahead of the gold line, which is the other 21700 lithium ion that I tested, and a bit further ahead of the Lumineer Nav, but that's not a fair comparison because the Lumineer Nav is using smaller 18650 cells, which are gonna be less energy dense. 
But nonetheless, the Molly cell is the clear winner here. So we know the Molly cell has great energy density, but we also care about the power density of the pack. And one way we can measure this is called the C rating. Here we take the maximum current that the battery is able to provide during the burst test and divide by the capacity of the pack to give a C rating. A four amp hour battery that can discharge at four amps is a one C pack. But of course, all our batteries do much better than this. The Molly cell discharges at 16 C at a peak and that's significantly higher than the 13C that you can get from the Gold Line or the 11.5C that you get from the Lumineer Nav. And this makes the Molly Cell really useful for cruising rapidly, chasing faster targets, or climbing quickly when you're you know, starting a mountain dive, for example. The final chart I wanna show you is voltage sag. A pack that can maintain a higher voltage is gonna give you better efficiency and more performance, more RPM at the prop. What we can see is that the Molly cell is able to maintain a higher voltage during its discharge compared to either the Gold Line or Lumineer nav packs, and that's particularly noticeable at the start of the pack and towards the end, where it pulls ahead of the other two. In the middle, it's pretty similar to the Gold Line, so it depends where you are in the discharge curve, but in general, the Molly cell is doing better overall. So having looked at all of that data, the results are pretty conclusive. My DIY Molly cell P45B pack has a bit of an edge over any of the commercial lithium ions I've tested so far by about 8% or so. And some of that might be down to the cells, but some of it might also be down to the construction of the pack. To show you what I mean, I'm gonna cut apart the gold line pack and show you how it's made inside. All right, so let's cut apart this gold line pack and see what cells they're using and how it's constructed. So we can see removing the outer coating that Goldline are using their own cells on these packs. So it's an INR cell 21700, A45 by Goldline, 3.6 volts, four amp hours. So immediately we can tell that this is not the same as the Molly cell because the Molly cell is a 4500 milliamp hour cell and this is only a four amp hour cell. Let's cut apart a little more of this inner lining so we can see how the cells are actually constructed. So we can immediately see a pretty clear difference between this commercial lithium ion pack and the one that we made. The gold line pack has the cells connected with nickel strips and six little spot welds on each contact. Compare that to our DIY Molly cell pack where we have this copper braid connected with these big solder joints here. The resistance of this copper braid is much, much less than the resistance of this nickel strip. And the contact resistance of a solder joint is much less, much better than the contact resistance of these six little tiny spot welds. And you can see some really clear evidence of this on this pack here. Do you see these brown charred areas? During the burst test, these nickel strips got so hot that they were able to char the adhesive that is used to attach the foam onto the bottom of this pack. And if I flip the pack over, you can see that the nickel strips got hot enough to char uh, on the top of the pack as well. Compare that to our copper braid, much lower resistance, and I checked this straight after the burst test and it wasn't even hot. So the extra resistance that these little nickel strips are adding to the pack is obviously gonna affect its ability to deliver a lot of current and it's gonna reduce its burst performance on the battery tester. So there we have it. If you want the best performing lithium ion pack for your long range drone, don't discount DIY. You might be able to buy better cells and build a better pack overall than one you could buy. That brings us to the end. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, there's a link down in the video description to my previous lithium ion battery testing, which is well worth a watch if you haven't seen it, as well as links to my website, aosrc.com, where you can find more product testing data, recommended products, information about AOS products, and loads more. That's all I have for you for today. So until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.